Welcome everyone and thank you for tuning in to the first webinar of season four of Climate in the Arts Ongoing Solutions Showcase. I'm your host, Frances Littman, the founder of Creatively United for the Planet Nonprofit Society. I'd like to start by gratefully acknowledging the Coast Salish people, plants, trees, waters, and land, where we have the privilege to be working, playing, living, and speaking with you from today. As well, we'd like to thank our lead partner in this series, Jonathan O'Reardon of the Gail O'Reardon Victoria Foundation Legacy Fund, as well as our sponsors, Lifestyle Markets, Spinnaker's Brew Pub, Miles Craig of KauaiPerfection.com, Horn Coupar, and McAvoy Rule. We have a jam-packed program filled with inspiring stories of what's possible, all in keeping with this season's theme of regeneration and transformation. Some of you may have seen this graphic, which clearly shows the benefits of regeneration versus degeneration. Today, we are going to hear from a number of individuals who have charted a regenerative course for their communities. Please feel free to put any questions you may have in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen, and we will endeavor to answer as many questions as we can later in the program. What doesn't get answered live today will be included with the replay link and other resources, which registrants will receive by email next week. So just minutes from downtown Victoria, British Columbia, here on the west coast of Vancouver Island is a community known as Oakland's Rise. Approximately 15 blocks of this neighborhood has been transformed into a Von Erf a Dutch term for a living yard, popularized in Europe where healthy, happy communities focused on people versus cars are the priority, where streets are sidewalk free and filled with boulevard gardens, kids playing, people strolling, neighbors conversing, and the sharing of food and neighborhood beautification projects are the norm. Joining me today is John <clears throat> O'Brien, an Oakland's Rise resident and one of the catalysts behind Victoria's first Von Arf communities. Welcome, John. Hi, Francis, and thanks so much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, we're thrilled to have you. And you and your partner chose to return to the Oakland's area as your new neighborhood after living abroad for quite some time and discovered after settling in that 30 feet of sidewalk going absolutely nowhere was mandated to be put in on your sidewalk free beautiful street due to city bylaw requirements related to a new construction project. Tell us like what transpired and, and why aren't sidewalks necessarily the best thing for neighborhoods? Well, that's a, a, a great question. And I have to say that the uh, requirement of a bylaw to put in a sidewalk from some perspectives would make good sense. It's offloading the cost of public infrastructure to new development. But uh, when we got 21 neighbors behind uh, our house in the backyard exploring what, how did we feel about it? What did we really love about this area? And, and uh, we discovered that in fact, um, most people appreciated the ambiance of the area and felt that it had potential to develop into something really special. And this sidewalk would be 30 feet of cement, as you say, in the middle of nowhere. And that was a catalyst for beginning a research project, essentially. Uh, I started looking into the whole question of what makes the sidewalk safe or why do we think that it is? And I discovered that the data associated with slips and falls on sidewalks is in health related data, not in traffic related data. And I began as I dove deeper to discover that in the Netherlands, which had been veering towards the North American model, a very car centric model of uh, suburbs and the need to drive simply because of the way of urban planning, discovered that they had charged their traffic engineers to reduce the risk of harm. And what the discovery was that invasive engineering was actually giving people the illusion of being safer. And it certainly made politicians look like they were looking after people. But in reality, the statistics showed that you weren't actually safer. And what made people safer was busy streets filled with people living, walking, kids learning to ride bikes, people walking their dogs, visiting with their neighbors, exchanging plants. Cars with a local purpose are welcome, 
but they have to navigate the space. And then you draw on things like urban uh, street furniture, uh, plants and that sort of stuff. So from a safety perspective, it, like you're not safer because cars seem to think if people are on sidewalks that they can just speed down a street. So are, are, did you have any like people who thought that, geez, we have to have a sidewalk, you know, this is a good idea because it will make my kids safer? Of course. And in fact, I have to admit that, you know, I come from the same North American thinking. Um, and what we've had to do as we've gone forward is we've looked at what is it that people are exactly wanting out of their experience in this neighborhood. And for some people, safety is the issue. For other people, it's about restoring pollinator habitats. For other people, it's about slowing traffic just because of the noise. And we've discovered that we have to really target our learning and our approach and communication to what really speaks to people. And on the safety issue, one of the most obvious examples is that we have a multi-generational neighborhood and a residential facility, the excellent Cridge Center for the Family just down the block. And when you see people leaving the Cridge Center, which is a seniors residential facility, they're on walkers or in motorized wheelchairs, and even though there is a sidewalk there, they actually come to the middle of the street and start heading up to the Von Erf. And the reason for that is that they're actually safer on a wide surface walkway than they are on a typical sidewalk where you have a dip and a slope every 25 feet and the risk of a curb and certainly the impossibility of walking side by side two wheelchairs abreast with a friend. So we've decided that the way to be safe in the neighborhood is to make sure that we're looking at the needs of all of the different populations, whether that's, as I say, kids learning to bike, the daycare centers in the area, right up to the seniors. And uh, so far, so good. Well, that's excellent. So I, I guess as someone who's maybe never done that in a community, how do you start bringing community together for something like that? And, and how did you manage to change long held beliefs and convince neighbors and council that when we live in such a car centric culture? Well, I, I think that, um, as I mentioned, we try to, to plug into what people's needs are. And uh, it helps that my partner and I both have big system backgrounds. And so we understand the value of models. I love concept modeling myself, actually. And looking at the intellectual capital of the area, which extends everything from who knows what to who has particular skills and interests and attributes. And you begin to map out those uh, characteristics as resources that you can bring to bear. We use the uh, Projects for Public Spaces model that's on the screen now. And the interesting thing about that is that it is an exact mirror, uh, uh, and I don't know which came first actually, of the SEPTED model, crime prevention through environmental design. And as Victoria is a densifying area, one of the concerns of citizens is not only increased traffic, but the increased risk of petty crime. So these are all models that we use to uh, illuminate the idea of uh, community wellness basically. Now, this particular model has attributes in the center. You can see sociability, uses and activities, access and linkages, which is the transportation piece. The next ring are the intangible aspects of uh, that, those kinds of attributes. And the outside ring are measures. Now, one of the measures is diversity and uh, something that's very important to us, but this particular model was based in the States and here in Canada, we take a bit of a broader view of what diversity is. So we look at these models and interpret them through the lens of the community we live in. And how did and you do that, John? Like, did you bring people together in your backyard and, or did you just go, did a bunch of you just, was it just a handful of you or did you get oh. the whole neighborhood mobilized? That's a, a great question too. I mentioned that we had 21 people at the start in the backyard. It emerged that seven of us would be leaders in the sense of forming a planning group. But uh, our big outreach came in August of 2018 when we launched a community survey and we had an excellent 52% uh, return. And that enabled us to build and inform our progress with the real interests and needs of the community. And it also empowered us in terms of speaking to council because now we had statistics. 
The council uh, was very supportive. We've had council support three times now unanimously. And one of the concerns, of course, is that they are responsible for safety in the city to a large degree. And so we asked them to measure the speed on the street. And as a result of much of what we've been doing, we're, we're measured at 22.7 kilometers, which is extraordinary and below the uh, uh, risk limits that's shown in, in most of the charts about risk of harm through accidents. Well, so that's terrific, no sidewalks. And you're showing that the speed limit has come down and that there's more safety. That's yeah. terrific. Yeah, absolutely. But it brings us back to some of those questions of what are what are the bylaws and what are the structures? One of the challenges that we face is that our entire economic system and our governance model is based around more formal organizations interacting. And those are very important. I mean, that's where a lot of the research comes from. That's where some of the uh, uh, planning and some of the assessment models come from. So that's all important. But change actually happens through people doing stuff on the ground. The challenge for us is then that we're an unorganized group of people uh, who then must interact with uh, organizations that have a certain amount of inertia. And I'll just use a couple of examples to illustrate how that takes shape uh, and affects the Von Erf. Uh, plants, for example, in certain areas are supposed to be no more than 18 inches high. And the theory behind that is that it maintains sight lines for a driver. Well, that all seems to make good sense in terms of safety until you think about the fact that the driver can now see five blocks ahead and speed because he's somewhat comfortable with the idea that nobody's in the way. Uh, one of the principles of the Von Erf is to use things that actually do require a navigation in the space. So we're looking at connecting with community artists and we're, for example, have been supported by the city and gifted with some hexagonal uh, planters. We held a community initiative to have uh, a committee of neighbors choose from among five artists. And then we had two painting events in which kids took part under the guidance of the artists. And then uh, we also had another opportunity to engage people through a zero escape demonstration garden, which involved a learning exercise and planning exercise, design exercise actually, uh, with the assistance of sanitative plants and uh, eventually cultivate, uh, 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 took place as a, um, a model of a kind of gardening that's low impact, low water uh, and low yeah. ecosystems. So all of these provide opportunities for getting people to engage and it's through that engagement we learn where we need to go. Fantastic. And things moved along with council th and more, you know, more people need a, someone like you on their street. That's what they need. <laughs> well, so, thank you for that. <laughs> but you're willing to speak to neighborhood groups. I gather there's a committee of you that loves speaking to neighborhood groups about these types of things. So if anyone on this program is interested in bringing a Von Erf to their neighborhood, um, we'll let you put, we will put the website uh, address and contact information if it's okay with you, John. That would be super. Chat. Yeah, and um, we'll thank you so much for keeping the story, you know, alive and fresh by expanding your neighborhood because it's gone beyond 15 blocks now, I think. And it's the, the vision is the 15 block stretch and the set of contiguous sidewalk free streets. We want to preserve a green lung in a densifying city. And I am speaking uh, to the Quadra Cedar Hill uh, Community Association on February 22. And as you say, I'm, I'm happy to chat with people about the potential. Ah, well, we'll post that event in our events calendar, too, so people can learn about that, which is at creativelyunited.org. So thank you so much for sharing this. Your website is fabulous. It has lots of information. And uh, here's to expanding your neighborhood and keeping the tourists coming to it because it's something to see. So thank you, John. Thank you, Francis. So also supporting a car-free culture is Julian West, who is on a mission to change the regulatory framework around transportation and residential fossil fuel use, so as to begin the transition to a zero carbon world. For most of a century, we have built cities following a deeply unsustainable development pattern. 
urban sprawl. That is the expansion of low density development over large areas of land, putting long distances between homes, stores, and areas of employment, and creating a dependency on private automobiles. No matter how well-intentioned, it's undeniable this pattern of development has had enormous environmental, social, and economic consequences, from deforestation and climate change to social isolation and crushing financial burdens. Welcome, Julian. Your company, Urban Thrive, is on a mission to not only make Victoria, British Columbia a model of sustainable urban development, but to inspire other builders, communities, and cities across North America to follow your lead in creating car-free housing with emphasis on healthy, environmentally conscious living. Now, as a father of three, you are undoubtedly concerned and understand the importance of uh, how, how important it is to find solutions to mitigate the worst effects of climate change and keep the global rise in temperature below two degrees. So how do you envision creating the change needed to lower carbon emissions and win support for car-free housing with your new social venture, Urban Thrive? Well, Francis, thank you so much. Um, you know, actually, this is a, a, a great segue from, from uh, John's work, and I'm very inspired by what John's doing. And I think we have a lot of the same values and a lot of the same goals, but maybe approaching it in slightly different ways. But very much comes down to community design. And for, as, yeah, as you mentioned in the intro, we've designed our communities around, around cars for, uh, you know, more than 75 years. And, uh, you know, the research on this, whether you're looking at the environmental, social, or economic side of this, is that's unsustainable. And we, we know how to build thriving, inclusive, more sustainable communities. We just need to put those lessons into practice. So Urban Thrives is designed to be a catalyst to get us there, sort of project by project, helping these neighborhoods evolve to kind of realize this sort of new vision for um, for what, you know, a new way of living a new lifestyle and helping those neighborhoods sort of shift in that direction. And cycling's a huge part of that. And I gather like it's so liberating as I know as someone who rides a, now an electric bike and rarely takes my car anywhere. There's no need for it. I just find it's, and it's so much fun to get out. And that convenience and fun is what you're building into your developments. Do you want to talk about that a little? Yeah, so our, our projects are very much um, cycling is at the center. So we design our, our homes from the ground up on a car free lifestyle. So number one is location. So it's around the downtown core where there's lots of amenities. Uh, you know, downtown is our center of employment and so forth. Uh, it's got to be close to AAA cycling network. It's got to be close to transit. So location is absolutely everything. If this isn't this isn't viable in a lot of neighborhoods in the capital region just because of the, the way they've been designed, but around downtown and you know Fernwood and Fairfield and uh, Oaklands and so forth, these are these are fantastic neighborhoods to live this lifestyle. So location is number one, uh, but number two. Um, is we build this huge bike garage in, in our projects. So every family can have cargo bikes, standard bikes, e-bikes, kids bikes, all the bells and whistles um, designed to be really, really convenient. So it's like the number one thing you go to. And then we also provide a car share vehicle on site in neighborhoods that have other car share vehicles for when that's the right tool for the job. So, you know, I'm car free. I do 95 of my trips out of the house by bike. Uh, and when you're in these neighborhoods where it's like, you know, it's 10 minutes to get downtown, um, that's just simply the funnest, most convenient, most practical way to get around. And we try and build that right into, um, right into our projects. Uh, and then like a moto car share really fills that gap where you do have to go to Sydney for something or you've got to go to the hardware store. So you can just borrow the vehicle when you need it. Uh, and it's just a very practical way to basically have all of your bases covered. Uh, we have uh, a wait list of people who want to live in our homes and we ask them like, how do you, how do you want to get around? Uh, and the number one way is, is people want to cycle. And in these kind of neighborhoods, it's, it's just, you know, beyond being fun and beyond carbon emissions. Um, it's just practical. It sure is. I have to say, like, I think that Victoria especially is one of the most bike friendly, like it's just, thank goodness they put in bike lanes as they have, because I mean, we're a city that should be seen on a bike and savored rather than just, you know, whizzing by in a car. So it, you know, as far as affordability, you know, it's hard to say any home in Victoria can be affordable, but, you know, taking cars out of the equation, uh, I bet you brings the cost down. Can you talk about that? 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so we, without even realizing it, we, we're paying a very high price today um, for the right to park a car. Um, from, a, er, from a real estate and urban design standpoint, um, it's just extraordinarily expensive and it, and it drives the design process. Um, you know, just quickly an example here, I'm, I'm renting a townhouse right now. Um, 50% of my exterior space is if pavement or a driveway. Um, 30% of the actual building is a garage. Uh, and then the rest is my living space, right? That's a huge, that's a huge impact. So in our projects, we take that out all together. We provide more of the things that are really of value, more trees, more green space, more human uh, centric and community oriented design. And then we can also, because we're saving all that space, we can put a few more homes in the same size piece of land and spread out all of our costs, land costs, architecture costs, all of them, uh, which means we can reduce the price and provide it at a more attainable level. Well, that makes total sense. And, and, and it sounds like it's also, it's greener. I mean, you're lowering carbon emissions by also going with heat pumps, I gather, and getting away from fossil fuel based uh, products, right? Yeah. So, you know, we're really um, tackling the elephants in the room on this, right? So the two uh, largest sources of emissions in our region, by far, number one is personal vehicles, double any other source. Uh, and number two is residential fossil fuel heating. Those two combined are 57% of our community level emissions in the CRD. We're taking both of those right out of the equation. And on top of that, we're trying to use low carbon materials and all the rest of it. Um, this is honestly the practical application of, of climate action, right? It's like, like, what are the big buckets of emissions that we need to address and how do we practically deal with those? Uh, we, we've essentially designed that into our business model from the ground up. Excellent. And, and how has council been? I mean, not that long ago, people would look at you like you had two heads to even have this discussion. People still look at me like I have two heads, um, oh, but, no. but, the, but then there's just as many um, and actually more people who are sort of ch championing us and, and speaking in favor of us and helping lift us up. Um, overall, honestly, it's, the response has been really, really positive, um, but our barriers are pretty high. Um, being the first one to do this, you know, half my job is storytelling, right? To explain, you know, in, in a very strong car culture that we have, right? It's very much baked into everything about our lives. So I have to spend a lot of time telling the story. Well, you know, there's lots of people who live car free, like 20% of households in the city of Victoria don't own a car. And those who do own a car usually only just own one, right? So um, I have, I, you know, collect a lot of data and research and I, and I just spend the time to meet with people one-on-one -on -one and in group settings to kind of just tell the story. My hope is that by building these, it will show people just like, here's, here's the difference, right? Do you want like, more affordable housing and trees and community design or do you want you know housing and pavement and parking spots like it's it's literally that like the, the trade-off yeah. um and when we show that i think people are going to want to live there i think cities are going to want it i think builders and developers are going to be like yeah i want to do that too once we demonstrate it works there's a market for it and and showcase what that can do for a community well and i just think that to me is a no brainer, especially when we've got such a homeless situation. I mean, we've got parking stalls and garages and all these homes for cars and we need homes for people. And so I love that that is your focus. So thank you so much for bringing car free housing to the forefront, filling in that missing middle piece and providing a more healthy and sustainable lifestyle. Because truly, once anyone gets into cycling now on an electric bike and with your panniers, which can take all your groceries, and I like, I'll bring home 50 pounds of groceries on my bike, no problem. It's just easy. It's perfect. You get to whiz by the traffic and be done with the stress. And, and, and it's fun. So thank you, Julian. Good luck. And it's, it's such an exciting vision. And we all need to be talking about this more in our neighborhoods and bring it forward. So thank you again. Thanks, Francis. Now, moving over to the mainland, joining us is Eleanor Boyle, a Vancouver, BC-based author and activist for food that is healthy, sustainable, and fair. And Emily Pickett, who has been involved in various animal advocacy programs since joining the Vancouver Humane Society in 2014. Welcome, Eleanor, and welcome, Emily. Eleanor, 
Could you just please uh, start by telling us a bit more about your background as a plant-based diet passionista? I think that's what you are. You are so passionate about uh, healthy solutions to reducing the impacts of climate change. Thank you, Francis, And thank you, John and Julian. I am stoked to be part of this community of solutions oriented people. Thank you. Yeah, I've been really passionate about food issues for a long, long time and um, really been disturbed through my life that there's plenty of food in the world, but still many people hungry that uh, we're producing food unsustainably when it's not necessary to do so. And uh, a number of years ago, I realized that most food activists were focused on, on the eat local piece, which is important, but for climate and for a lot of environmental reasons, really meat and milk offer, offer the problems and they offer the solutions. Excellent. Yes. And so you've done a couple books. And can you tell us about your books and what you've got one soon to be released, right? Oh, look at this. Look at that beautiful cover of your new book. Francis wanted me to show the book. I'm really not a self promoter. I've given whole talks about books that when which I've forgotten to mention my book. <laughs> But, but this one is upcoming um, in, in a few months. And it tells the story of Britain in World War II and its quest to transform its food system to make sure that the entire population would be fed during chaotic times. Uh, I, I feel that, that our climate crisis is, is our war and there are really hopeful and practical lessons from it for, for today. But my pre previous book focused squarely on, on, on meat, uh, uh, meat and milk, uh, animal, animal source foods, and as I said, the problems and the solutions that they offer. So very briefly, this is a really dynamite graph, came from a very high profile, well-respected academic study recently. Uh, it shows that animal-based foods in their production create way more greenhouse gases than any plant-based foods. All the long lines at the top of the graph, they're all meat, beef, of course, uh, that long horizontal line, that's how many greenhouse gases it produces per, for, to give us 100 grams of protein. But beef, it's not the only culprit, beef, lamb, prawns, um, beef from a dairy herd, cheese, milk, uh, pork, etc. And the little lines at the bottom are all tofu, nuts of various kinds, peas, etc. Um, and people often are, are not sure, like, how the heck does meat produce all of these greenhouse gases? And the most really succinct way to think about it is land use and gas production. To produce meat uses way more land, including recently deforested Amazon rainforest and gas production. A lot of very potent greenhouse gases come from the production of, of all, all meats, not just, not just ruminants. And of course, this is how we produce uh, most of the meat that you see in the stores. Uh, it's obviously un kind, to put it mildly, to the animals. It's unhealthy for the animals and it's also unhealthy for us because this kind of mass production encourages people to eat more than is good for them. And you know, we've been thinking about pandemics. These are major pandemic risks. Viral diseases often arise when animals are in excessively close proximity to, uh, to each other and, and, and to us. Good news. Uh, lots of lots of people in industrialized countries across the world are are definitely moving toward plant based. I love these headlines. They're from uh, Canada, the U.S., and the U.K., but um, we really see this as well in um, in other European countries. And uh, this is a useful graph as well. the The longer the black line, the more emissions you are saving by adopting this diet. So at the top, the Mediterranean diet is helpful, but at the bottom, a vegan diet is even more helpful. You know, the, um, the evidence has been slam dunk for, for, for many years, but I have really experienced this having worked in this space for 30 years, uh, that governments have been extremely reluctant to uh, raise the ire of, of food multinationals and, and even to, to annoy voters. But uh, there have been some bright spots and, and one I, just really my last my last slide the one I want to mention is Canada's newest food guide um, you know food guide has been considered extremely mainstream for a long time but in this last round of revisions to again Health Canada's national food guide um, it's it's really quite radical meat has been relegated to weigh the top right hand corner as only one of many 
possible protein sources. Um, so, so governments have a hard time dealing with this, but this is a this is definitely a bite, bright spot. I think there's some progress. Well, that's great to know. Thank you, Eleanor. Like, that's amazing that that actually came to light. So how did that come to light? I mean, really, our Canada Food Guide is actually, this seems rare. Because I know as a child for years and years, it was all about meat and dairy. And so how wonderful. Oh, this it's so true. Great. Okay, I'll, t I'll tell you a story that most people don't know. When it was time to revise the food guide, which happens, I think it's every 10 years, the very, our very gutsy, the, our health minister at the time was the very gutsy Jane Philpot. Some of you may remember if you fall Canadian politics that she was later kicked out of caucus, but over the Jody Wilson-Raybould SNC-Lavalin affair. But we had the gutsy health minister, Jane Philpot, and she instructed all of her senior bureaucrats that they were not to take meetings with lobbyists from major food companies, meat, dairy, processed food. This was radical. And the companies were extremely unhappy to put it mildly, but we ended up getting this amazing food guide, which is probably one of the most sustainable and healthy on the planet now. How wonderful. Well, and your affiliation with Emily, this is this, Emily. Were, yeah, our lovely Emily here. Emily, Emily is a dynamo. And, and, Emily, and, the Vancouver, yeah. and the Vancouver Humane Society is such a such an amazing organization. Yeah, um, I heard about the uh, all the work that they had done for Vancouver City Council and uh, just hopped on to help a bit as a speaker. But but really, she deserves uh, the credit. Um, for well, the can you go back and just tell us, like, how does the Humane Society relate to food? Like, so how does Emily fit, fit into this picture? Like, how did you guys meet? Because I know I learned of Emily when we were trying to connect for a pre-interview for this webinar. And Eleanor, you mentioned you had to speak at a Vancouver Council meeting. And the story of Emily emerged from this conversation. So you, tell us what that meeting was about and how Emily and the Humane Society figure into this story. Our food systems are largely about animals. Our, our diets are meat-based. Our food system is animal agriculture-based. So their work is very relevant to the food system. Right. So Emily, what was the action that you brought forward to Vancouver Council that got Eleanor there as a speaker as well? And I gather you had you had a victory or a several victories. I'd love to, we'd love to hear about it. For sure. Well, um, first of all, thank you for inviting me to speak today, Francis and, and Eleanor for setting the stage for this uh, important discussion. I think I'll just quickly add a bit more background as to why the Vancouver Humane Society as you know, an animal protection organization is involved in this plant-based food issue. Um, you know, as Eleanor has touched on, the industrialization of animal agriculture is a, a real pressing animal protection issue with hundreds of millions of farmed animals being raised for food every year in Canada. So we saw it as an important animal protection issue. So VHS for a number of years now has worked to support food system change toward, you know, a more humane, healthy and sustainable food system. And we've worked with a lot of schools and student clubs, healthcare facilities to kind of improve public access to um, these plant based menu options through initiatives like Meatless Monday, which um, huge kudos to Eleanor for, for doing so much work on that as well over the years. Um, but locally, I think it's really important to know that you know, if we're looking at the Vancouver context, at least that food consumption makes up nearly half of Vancouver's ecological footprint, which I think surprises a lot of people. And that 98% of that is actually linked to the land and energy used to produce food and animal products in particular. So it's really important when we talk about local food, local food is so important, but what also is really important is the type of food that we eat. So there's perfect overlap there where we can support local and we can support plant-based at the same time. It doesn't have to be one or the other, but I just think it's important because a lot of people talk about local food and we do need to talk about the type of food as well, not just where it's from. But I think, you know, while this may seem like a really daunting issue, I choose to see it as just a major opportunity to create change that, that, you know, will benefit animals, will benefit people and the planet. So circling back to kind of your initial question, that was really what sort of um, led us to commission this report that looks at current food purchasing strategies at the city of Vancouver level. And I'll share a link to that report um, in the chat box after, but it looks at direct food related spending at the municipal level. So things like, you know, um, catering contracts that the city of Vancouver has, or, uh, you know, food that they order for events or meetings. 
as well as indirect food spending. So that could be where you know, they offer food related funding, um, other municipal food related spending that they have input on. And so this report um, proposes replacing 20% of the volume of animal based foods purchased um, by the city of Vancouver to plant based alternatives. And the impact of that, which again, you can look in depth in the report to get all the details, but um, by doing that, the city of Vancouver could expect to save up to $99,000 um, annually, reduce greenhouse gas emissions by more than 500 tons, and save the equivalent of nearly 400 um, farmed animal lives on an annual basis. So there's a lot of different, different sort of co-benefits to doing this. So where this kind of got to at the, the city level where we had Eleanor and others present, we shared this report with municipal decision makers at the city of Vancouver. And it ultimately resulted in a motion that went before city council earlier this month. And it was put forward by Councillor Pete Fry. And the motion was great. It, it acknowledged the benefits of shifting towards more plant-based procurement and ultimately directed staff to, to report back on how this sort, of a pol this sort of policy change could be put in place. So we had speakers, obviously, including the Vancouver Humane Society to kind of speak to the report itself. We had Eleanor, as well as um, local plant-based business owners, uh, Asha Wielden of Kula Kitchen, which is a fantastic plant-based business, and Ryan McKee of Elemento. Um, and they all spoke in support of this motion. So we were really excited to see, you know, after that discussion that, that um, city council unanimously passed it. We were thrilled by that and certainly we'll be staying in touch you know, on next steps and helping them um, on ways that they can implement that. But we're hopeful it's going to set a really strong precedent for other communities as well. This is something that can happen anywhere that people can kind of um, get involved in their communities and, and sort of point to this as a great example to follow. So I wanted to share just a couple of lessons that we learned from this work that I thought would be really useful for this sort of a, a webinar and group. Um, you know, the first being that that citizens can have a huge impact in their communities. I think sometimes we think, oh, it's such a big issue. I don't think I can do anything on my own. I'm just one person. But individuals play a crucial role at getting changes done, particularly at the municipal level. And I think this is a really good example. We had individuals with all different skill sets and forms of expertise that they brought to the table. So of course, you know, VHS, we had our report and the research that we could kind of back up our ask of the city Eleanor, as, as you know now, has expertise um, as a well-researched author on this topic. Asha runs uh, a local plant-based business, so she can talk about how this benefits local business. Same with Ryan running a LMNO, which um, you know he works on plant-based meal programming in schools. So he could really say, this is what this could look like in practice. So I think it was a, a really clear example of how um, you know, public support was just absolutely instrumental in getting this passed. Um, and then I think just, you know, in terms of how the public can support changes in their communities with some of these lessons, I think some of the key things to do are, are really reaching out to and engaging with your elected representatives in government. I think that's so important. Um, you know, they want to hear from, from the people who elected them from their constituents. So talk to them, talk to them about the community issues that matter to you and raise that you're a constituent and you want to, you want to, um, have some time to chat with them about these things. And I think another thing from this sort of example is connect with groups and organizations that are already out there in the community doing work on the issues that you care about. Because again, we had the resources to draft this report and to put this forward. But you know, then we, we had these um, local residents that come forward, Eleanor and others, to say, we support this. Let's, let's throw our support behind this and show how local residents support um, you know, this sort of change. And so it takes, it takes everybody. Um, and then I think finally, you know, another useful tip is really just connecting those issues with existing government objectives. So look at, you know, what, what is your city working on already? What have they committed to um, on climate issues or on animal protection issues, public health? Um, so in this case, you know, the city had declared a climate emergency as many others have, and they have a climate emergency action plan. So we saw that as a perfect way, and it does touch on, on um, food. And sustainable diets. So we thought, okay, you, you care about this issue. You've identified it as being important at the city level. Here's what you can start to do in just little ways, little steps that can start to move in the right direction. So yeah, so I just wanted to share some of those, those insights. Oh, that's excellent. Thank you. And congratulations, Emily, on challenging long-held practices and beliefs 
that could help lower the carbon footprint of the city of Vancouver, inspire others on this program to look into this themselves and create a more compassionate future. So thank you. And thank you, Eleanor. Keep up the great work and, and thank you for making this planet much more livable. Thank you again. Our next guest, Rizel Juan Salvarita, is a multidisciplinary artist from the Philippines. In 2018, Rizel presented a TEDx talk on artivism, affecting environmental consciousness through art. His impact in local and international eco-artivism brought him to a deeper sense of commitment by becoming a teaching artist and integrating creative awakening to supplement practices that support behavioral and perspective change among grassroots communities. Rissell has represented the Philippines in two United Nations climate change conferences, COP11 in Montreal and COP13 in Bali, Indonesia where he is one of the climate artist campaigners and an environmental journalist. For more than two decades, he has continued to work as an environmental educator, community-based facilitator, and consciousness activator with various local and international nonprofit organizations. Most recently, Rissell led and co-facilitated an ongoing series of creative recovery workshops focusing on women farm workers, which we will see during this interview, which was pre-recorded due to the 15-hour time zone difference. Thank you for joining us. When you turned 21, you mm -hmm. had a birthday that found you literally in your birthday suit, roaming yeah the streets virtually naked painted white while environmental messaging was emblazoned on your back and your chest and it was the threat and loss of critical uh critical watershed in the so-called protected park area of negros island is that correct yes. yeah yeah where you live that was under threat from extraction industries and it seemed like very few people knew about it on your 21st birthday, you launched into becoming a known nonviolent performance artist, or as you say, an eco artivist. You used your near nakedness to uncover and expose the truth about plans for this special area, this precious area of forest and clear water and a watershed. And your actions helped grow awareness, which resulted in this area being saved. And you raised public consciousness about the importance of the environment. So did you feel unsafe doing this? Because I understand that environmentalists are frequently murdered in your country. Yeah, um, here in the Philippines, being an activist made me environmental or political activist is a dangerous endeavor. And um, there had been a number of, of, of deaths, you know, um, related to activism. But during my time when I opted to, you know, um, offer my birthday present to uh, Lake Palinsasaya, which is the watershed, I felt um, there's this, there was an energy of, of really trusting the, the, the movement that, you know, it will provoke and activate the community. And during that time, there was, you know, a sense of nervousness, but somehow because of the ecstatic energy of support coming from friends, from community as well, I managed to overcome that and pursued the performance campaign, which really opened, um, you know, a, a whole lot of conversations and eventually led to the success of the campaign as well. Well, you're a shining example of what one person can do because you motivated uh, a country by the sounds of it. And <laughs> it went, it expanded beyond that. So that was back in 2004. And a lot has happened since, including you coming to Canada for COP11 uh, in Montreal and then COP16. Yes. And now this TEDx talk in 2018. And tell us more about the connection of creativity, compassion, and consciousness. Like, how does art enlighten ecological consciousness and compassion? Well, um, you know, um, for me, it's, you know, there's always that inner landscape within me that tells me that I am one with nature. My consciousness has got to be placed in the space where it's being held by nature, by the earth, and how can I be one with it? Um, and it's essential for me to also really um, allow that voice in me to, to be heard 
um, especially if it concerns about the environment, the trees, the forest, the oceans, which cannot necessarily say something. But, you know, through activations coming from deep compassion, um, 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 you know, the emotional quality within us where we can fully connect with our nature, there's always the tendency to awaken and really, you know, fight for what is right, what is justifiable, and what is really something that can sustain um, our community. And um, I believe as an artist, as a teaching artist, I see art as a tool, as a channel to um, activate, you know, uh, movements. And especially, you know, us having the body, basically body is a communion and communication device. And I feel that, you know, our bodies alone can, can be activated to um, convey the message um, that can really support uh, sustainability and also a just and livable um, planet um, for, for all of us. Yeah, you're right in the hot spot, as we know, in the Philippines. I mean, if anyone's uh -huh. experiencing and feeling climate change, it's it's you. And and so what what is what is it that people on this side of the world could maybe do to help? Um, yeah, well, we think about climate justice and and, you know, like we feel the brunt of 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 the effects of human induced climate um, change and. And I, I feel that I know I have friends like you and in the Western countries who are also advocating of their governments to really um, cut emissions and um, pledge um, fully to support you know, a global uh, unified sense of, of, of action to mitigate and eventually um, you know, fight climate change. You know? So um, I, I feel that um, you know, we um, as, as grassroots activists here in the Philippines, we are here to, to, to really convey the message, being, you know, bearing witness of what's happening here. And we hope that we can, you know, establish that uh, unified um, connection with, with everyone, you know, globally, especially those who are here right now, so that we can, you know, really push for that um, future. Uh, you know, as much as possible, you know, like soon, so that we can really make sure that, you know, things can, can regenerate and then be restored um, essentially for, for the good of, every, of everything. Well, that's the whole theme of this, this series is regeneration. And All right. compassion plays a role as, into that, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. How do you, how do you see that compassion and, and regeneration are interconnected? Well, yeah, you know, like I think of a, I think of a garden, and um, you know, compassion. It's it's like a seed bed for 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 things that can grow um, with loving kindness, with 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 consciousness that can really regenerate that essence quality of human beings as stewards of of our um, nature of, of the planet. Um, and I feel that, you know, um, as we continue on with our work and show that kind of kindness and then approach where um, it's, it's unifying everyone to come together, you know, share stories um, and inspire um, the movement. I feel that, you know, compassion and regeneration will eventually be, you know, the future um, pathway to, to hold space for this desire of, of a, you know, um, a beautiful community that, that we aspire to have. Well said. Yeah. You used a quote from the Dalai Lama in your TEDx talk that com uh, by uh, compassion is the new radicalization of our time. Is that it? Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. I truly believe in that. Yeah. Compassion yeah. activism. In your TED talk, Raz, you, you mentioned three, well, actually six words. And uh -huh. And, and, and I really love how they interconnect with each other because that's what your talk is very much about is the interconnectedness of things. Those six words, can you tell us what they are and, and just a little bit how they relate to each other? Uh, well, uh, those words, um, first, um, the words silent and listen. Um, if you look at it, they have the same characters. And essentially, this is probably the same meaning, but somehow when we look deeper to it, we can come into being silent within us so that it will allow us to listen. And it is with deep intention of being silent that we can listen to something essentially that will um, awaken us into something um, you know, provocative or, or something that will move us to, to render some endeavors for 
good or extend compassion. And then the words uh, scared and sacred, you know, um, this is like, these are the two words that a lot of, of our friends have been really like, sort of like get caught uh, um, in, in, in a bubble of wonderment because truly the word scared is something that um, very natural for a lot of us to feel. But um, I feel that when we see the sacredness of something um, in, that, in that element of being scared, we can you know, return to our senses of essentially dropping um, into a space of, um, of, of, of stillness and resilience as well so that we can function in a space or a situation where we feel that kind of uh, being scared. And then the last words are heart and earth. So both are, you know, basically having the same characters as well. And the heart of the earth is love. And love essentially is really the core of, of humanity, you know. And then it's where everything grows. It's where everything regenerates. And um, it's something that also guides us to sort of like um, actions when we come to that space of, of, of love so so all of those words have have much to do with with just becoming aware it, and uh -huh. and with awareness what i gathered is compassion is what yeah. you're saying, comes from awareness and being mindful helps us determine how to make better choices is that right mm -hmm. yeah, yeah that's true Mm -hmm. So you've worked with students creating hope and beauty while teaching environmental education with your junk to funk program. I love that name. Yeah. <laughs> Where garbage is given new life as art. And, and, uh -huh. and now you are celebrating women farm workers by creating art and documenting their connection to uh -huh. climate and the earth. Can you share a little bit about that with us? We started an organization called Barrio Balangao Creative Initiatives. And barrio means tiny village and balangao means rainbow. So it's, you know, like a rainbow village in the farm. So we started this last December uh, 2020, at, you know, about the middle part of the pandemic. And the reason behind it was to create a creative recovery program for the women farm folks. And um, we targeted the, the mothers, the women, because we feel that, you know, um, there is a need for a space for them to get together and feel um, heard and have a safe space to uh, co-create together with their fellow um, um, farm workers as well. So we got a small grant to um, pursue a creative wor um, workshop where they started creating um, embroidery works because that's sort of like the basic trade that they can remember um, doing like, you know, for so long. So it's really utilizing the hands and the imagination to um, work on their um, crafts. And also eventually we um, taught them how to um, paint as well. And they were painting their their lives, you know, as, as women farm workers. Essentially, it um, directed towards their connection with the land. And then also eventually the topic of climate change, where they can really see the, the, the effects and the impact of a microclimate um, in, 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 in the trade of, of farming. So we are, you know, in directing it towards um, our current project also with the International Teaching Artists Collaborative, um, Impact Climate, and they are collaborators for this um, specific uh, project um, here in the Philippines. That was just wonderful of, of Raz, as he likes to be called, to, to join us. And now we're going to move along. And we have been extremely fortunate to also have the opportunity to interview one of the leading Indigenous natural resource consultants, Gwyn Bridges. Gwyn works on natural resource issues with Indigenous peoples to ensure mutual benefits and equality in decision making with all levels of government. Adept in establishing new conceptual frameworks to support equity in negotiating government to government agreements, Gwyn's mission is to improve relationships between Indigenous nations and their partners, so people and natural resource conditions are improved. 
Quinn is a member of the Saddle Creek Cree Nation in Alberta, Canada. She received a Master of Science degree in Renewable Resources, studying in forest hydrology from the University of Alberta in 2000, uh, in the year 2000. And Gwyn has worked in the US and Canada as a hydrologist, water quality standards and source water protection expert, riparian habitat specialist, watershed planner, indigenous rights specialist, cultural research manager, and now a consultant. Gwyn started consulting in 2010, advising First Nations, First Nations organizations, other governments, and the private sector on relationships, natural resource, and economic development projects, including working on a water law project with the Lower Silkamine Indian Band. Thank you for joining us, Gwyn. Could you please share with us what Indigenous knowledge includes, and how can we have better inclusion of Indigenous knowledge? It's what Indigenous knowledge is, is the whole set of information that supports decisions that are made within a community. That includes ecological information, it includes social behavioral information, it includes information related to governance and decision making. And so when people are talking about the characteristics of traditional ecological knowledge, the characteristics of Indigenous knowledge, it's really to be viewed from this holistic lens. So it can buy, it's a comprehensive body of knowledge which guides an individual participating in that particular or any particular Indigenous society. Now what comes out of that and some of the challenges we're having when we're trying to negotiate agreements with government is communicating that holistic nature of that information. And as we know, government really has a siloized approach to how it um, considers information or draws information to those various siloed components, including things like the watershed planning and the old growth and, and forestry, um, new forestry planning initiatives. What um, I've been espousing is that this holistic nature needs to be more effectively considered to inform these agreements through um, better collaboration, better skills being developed within the province, better structures and organizational function to better support the uh, that coalescence of Indigenous knowledge. We know Indigenous communities have wealths of knowledge. Not all of it continues to exist because of the legacy of colonialism and residential schools, but that body of knowledge exists within community, but it's currently known within the community, but sort of fragmented amongst um, various individuals, various families, various, co various community um, cohorts, if you will. And so what needs to happen when we're and uh, moving through this uh, implementation of better inclusion of Indigenous knowledge, as DRIPA and, and the Declaration Act in BC references, is this need to support Indigenous communities to develop that consolidation of information in uh, a centralized way so that efficiencies can be created when people want to extract information from that body of knowledge. That's missing right now. So I've likened it to sort of this indigenous knowledge um, that everybody wants a piece of. And that's true, we know that all of this, the new term engagement fatigue is that each particular initiative within government, both federal governments and provincial governments and municipal and regional governments, we all want to understand and be better and have improved relationships and make better decisions using Indigenous knowledge. Those are all admirable and exciting um, objectives and intentions. However, it's like um, without the consolidation, articulation, codification of Indigenous knowledge, stories, laws, and without a strategy for the external communication of that, the First Nations are becoming challenged to be responsive to all of those initiatives. The risk there then is that these initiatives proceed in absence of uh, the inclusion of traditional knowledge, which is both problematic from a uh, land management perspective, just not getting the best information about how to manage the land, but it also essentially contradicts the intention of uh, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People Act in BC, because it precludes the type of collaborative management that was envisioned through those acts there needs to be a lot more capacity provided to create structures, whether those are databases, for example, in, in sort of technological infrastructure, 
or um, mechanisms for decision making around um, relationship building, who you're going to have a relationship with, what decisions are you going to be talking about, sort of internal discussion or internal decision making mechanisms, i.e., governance within community, and then um, just people who collect knowledge, uh, articulate that knowledge, write it down, codify it, make it available to non Indigenous people. I've been, you know, really focusing on really how do you come together and bring all of the information that's needed from either side, i.e. non-Indigenous and Indigenous, into a space of creativity. It's really important um, to be able to have this uh, ethical space-based dialogue to bring all of the relevant information in. First Nations need to be capacitized, I think that's a word, to be able to do that work. It's ex expensive and intensive because as Indigenous communities governance is being reinvigorated, there's a lot of community dynamics and community um, practice to reestablish community process of decision making, i.e. several meetings and various meetings with traditional knowledge holders or elders and youth and whatever that particular nation does to reinvigorate those things. So, and then you need, uh, like in some of my clients' cases, hiring lawyers to codify some of that information. If you go to community, you hear a story. Well, what are the important things with the, from that story that need to be communicated that would guide um, land management, watershed decisions, that kind of stuff? How do you make sure that you're communicating to the effective parties? And that brings it to the government side where right now, it's like there's a circle of indigenous knowledge or this TEK at sort of the, the center. And I heard this cool term, centering indigenous knowledge by one of uh, the groups I'm working, actually an international climate change group. Um, and they talked about centering indigenous knowledge, but you have to have that balloon filled so it contains information. And so right now it's kind of like a flat balloon. And, and then you have all around the outside, all these different initiatives that government is trying to figure out and do and solve our, our immediate and complex challenges, which are good things, but they're trying to pull all that information. So it needs to sort of, instead of trying to pull it out, it needs to support that core building. All of these initiatives in government, if I were to make this recommendation, would be to somehow develop the more collaboration between those, those initiatives, not to try and influence the nature of their particular initiative or the problem they're trying to solve, but that they support that building of Indigenous knowledge much more um, collaboratively amongst themselves. Because then, if you support that building of that or that filling of that balloon, then you create a whole lot of efficiencies when you want that information to be um, to, or to use that information before because now it exists and the communication will be much more effective and then um, it can be a, applied across multiple various initiatives. That's a challenge I think structurally for the provincial government and I think one of the main messages is well you don't need to um, abandon your intention for say water said planning or for old growth um, planning or for land use planning or for caribou protection, et cetera, et cetera. All those things are important. But if you're trying to pull from an empty balloon, you will fall or fail to efficiently meet the objectives you've set out for yourself in terms of the inclusion of indigenous knowledge and meeting under. Thank you, Gwen. Could you please tell us what resources and capacity are required by both Indigenous people and the government to include Indigenous knowledge in natural resource planning and land management? And are you optimistic? I think by nature, I'm an optimist, so that's very helpful. But I think the intention, what's really exciting is that all of these initiatives around Indigenous rights, UNDRIP and DRIPA, they're all, it's all exciting because it's so well-intentioned. Everybody wants to do the better thing, to have uh, more just and equitable relationships across this country. They want to have better land management um, and they want to find processes which are um, inclusive, which are respectful, et cetera, et cetera. So I think in that way, there's a lot of, um, there's, I'm really hopeful. The, the challenge is that trying to develop solutions to um, how, how to do that structurally on the government side and then capacity wise on the First Nation side is really challenging. So the capacity um, side on the indigenous side is there's this good story my friend said, well, we used to have 19 villages and 
thousands of people to do the land management within our territory. Now we have four and 600 people. How do we possibly um, enable ourselves to conduct the type of land management that we did when we were um, you know, with 19 villages and thousands of people. So it needs to rely on um, non-Indigenous people to support a lot of those mechanisms. Um, and to employ non-Indigenous people, you have to have that capacity. So one of the interesting things I've always thought, well, a lot of the work that we're trying to do on land management could be done uh, by First Nations, right? So we have all of this capacity within government. Um, and experts, et cetera, et cetera, deployed to doing land management, they could be potentially um, seconded potentially or, or, or hired directly by, by First Nations. This is something that the economics of all of that situation is something that it's a big, still a big gap in terms of First Nations ability to understand that, access the expertise to be able to deploy scenarios and choose scenarios related to economic trade-offs and opportunities within for various scenarios, whether they be that type of scenario or conservation financing. So um, that's just, I know, a, sort of a bit of a segue, but it's really important because the conversation uh, for government, those factions who are well-intentioned, but um, still adhering to uh, a particular path in relation to old growth extraction uh, or you know forest natural resource extraction and forestry and stuff like that is that um, the economic argument is one that uh, comes up a lot and first nations have a big challenge trying to um, communicate in that realm so i think that's um that's an important thing to consider for sure what can the public do to help remove barriers to indigenous knowledge so that indigenous voices are heard uh, there's there's all kinds of things the public can do and there's challenges within the broader society that are relating to um, things such as hidden bias systemic racism um, challenges in in educational quality like the disparity in in educational opportunities all of these kinds of things continue to be worked out and the truth and reconciliation calls to action really address a lot of those those social considerations I think as First Nations continue to um, advance their work, they're doing a lot more communication and outreach to the broader public about who they are, what they do, what their visions are. I think the, the general public needs to um, listen to that, um, have an open mind, be questioning always their assumptions about why they believe their perspectives are the right perspectives or the appropriate perspectives or the valid and credible perspectives. Why would whatever perspectives you're holding be the most correct ones? And why would they be any different or better or in what way are they different than the assumptions that um, could also be held? The challenge is of course, we don't know as a general public what those assumptions are that First Nations are bringing. So there, there are things around values cultural protocols, relationship development, how you are with each other, those kinds of things. And so one of the things that I'm recommending when, when people want to do engagement and they're, they're at a phase where they've done some of their general work, which should include things like learning basic history, what's a residential school, what's a treaty, what's the constitution, um, what is ethical space. Um, um, so they, they kind of learn that. Then they figure out, well, do they have any, they begin to question their assumptions. Do I have any potential bias? How has systemic racism impacted my life? And how am I embodying some of those perspectives, which are indeed just assumptions we've kept, we've absorbed? And then finally, well, how do I get to know my nation, right? And that's where I say nations are starting to uh, describe and put out there and do PR, if you will, to describe who they are a lot more better. But it's really learning about that particular history. Like if you're on Songhees, well, what's the history of Songhees? What happened? What are their particular visions and strategies and goals? They probably should all have strategic plans of some kind. Um, what are their cultural norms, that kind of thing. This notion of reciprocity, which is often talked a lot about Indigenous community, what can you bring forward without making a demand on an Indigenous nation? How can you help? I just mentioned a whole bunch of things around the capacity challenges. There's a lot of opportunity there. And it's sometimes just approaching to offer help is a capacity challenge. It's a, it's a burden to the nation. So you know, there's no easy solution there, but I think opening minds, learning as much as possible, and then the cultural protocol is really critical, I think so. 
Yes, thank you so much, Gwen. And I see that Gwen has joined us live. So we will have Gwen come on for the question and answers, which will be after our final presentation. And so if you have any questions about this presentation that Gwen just gave, um, please feel free to put it in the Q&A section and uh, we'll see if Gwen can still stay on for that. So our last overseas guest is Simon Sharkey. He's one of the founding directors of the National Theatre of Scotland, where he pioneered a theatre without walls approach across Scotland and the rest of the world, creating genre-defying participatory programs of professional art projects and festivals that have reached globally and impacted locally. Now, I met Russell, who you heard earlier, and Simon through an international teaching artist creative climate uh, Teaching Artist Climate Collective, which we are all engaged with. Simon recently took part in art curation and installation events at COP26, which was in his hometown of Edinburgh, Scotland, where I finally managed to reach him for this short pre-recorded interview, which opens with um, him answering my question. How was COP26? It was really weird um in in all sorts of ways because um it felt it felt like glasgow was being invaded and it, it wasn't done with glasgow or for glasgow and because it was such a global perspective um and because there were so many people coming to glasgow all the glaswegians disappeared so the streets were empty except for um van loads of police um, moving around the, the, the town uh, and there was no trouble. There was, there was nothing really going on. It felt like the first lockdown, it, it, especially in the, in the first week when all the presidents and, and the people in power were uh, arriving and there were motorcades coming in into Glasgow and um, some of which were being charged because it was electric cars that they were using, but they were using diesel uh, generators to charge them because there weren't enough charging points, um, which was strange. Inside, in the in the art centres and in the union halls and in the community centres and in local spaces and in churches and in, in places of gathering, there was a lot more activity going on that wasn't evident on the streets and it wasn't evident in the media but there was a definite atmosphere and buzz around what was being created because none of it was supported necessarily with any traditional funding routes to it it was happening in pockets that were dotted all over the city and not a lot of it was being covered. It wasn't until the second week that it, it started, until the marches happened, the youth march on the Friday and the, and the global march on the Saturday, when more and more people arrived so that they, their time in Glasgow could incorporate those two days. And at that point, it, it really exploded. And organisations like Extinction Rebellion, um, and uh, Walk for COP, um, She Changes Climate, um, lo lots of different organisations and networks um, began to appear and it began to, to, to bubble up. The atmosphere and the energy took a notable leap um, uh, in levels of engagement and levels of um, uh, visibility. You had um, Storm, which was a 10 metre puppet um, who rose from the, the sea and made a walk, a, a three mile walk from the community of Govan to the, the, the gates of the conference centre. You had Little Amal, who's a three metre puppet, um, who was created to, to um, walk from Syria to Manchester, um, uh, making the same walk that had been done by a, a real refugee child. Um, and this three meter puppet uh, met with the 10 meter puppet and they, they gifted each other um, some hope. You had um, Still Motion Arts making their light installations and Robert Montgomery made a huge light installation down at the, um, the landing hub in Glasgow. So these pockets of activity started popping up and becoming more active and more people were 
engaging with them. So there was more conversation happening um, around it and people were becoming more and more aware of each other's work and each other's intentions uh, behind the work. The way I felt about that was um, at last, because um, it felt as if it, um, the, the negotiations and the conference were happening very much behind closed doors. Uh, it wasn't until that that second week and there was a bit more awareness about what was going on, including in the venue and, and the bits and pieces that I put around in, in, in Glasgow. I've, I'm still reflecting on it. I'm still processing it. But what I heard umpteen times was delegates saying that had, had it not been for the activists and the artivists, the tone of the conversations that was happening within the, 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 the halls of the conference centre would have been completely different. I genuinely feel as if the truth hit through without the blah, blah, blah. You couldn't deny the crowds that gathered around these puppets. You couldn't deny the story that was told by uh, Rosamund Kissy Deborah about her daughter dying from air pollution. You couldn't deny uh, the, the ideas um, behind the Brazilian films that we exhibited where um, swathes and swathes of lands and communities and rivers were being killed. It was there in your face, all the evidence was there. And so they had to carry that kind of stuff into, into these negotiations. It, it brought a bit of humanity to it. Over a hundred thousand people attended that march and the atmosphere was absolutely incredible. It wasn't celebratory in any way, although there was it, it was uplifting to have that amount of people um, all walking with the same purpose chanting the same thing um, and, and carrying that energy around uh, and then that energy being um, brought into the negotiations. I don't think that we would have been um, heading towards um, a COP every year um, it had those things not happened in, in Glasgow. And I'm really, really proud of the art artists and activists and activists that, that came here and slept on people's floors. And there was one company from Southeast Asia called Fearless who came here and they were given, they, they got in touch with me really late and we tried to find them a, a wall to paint and they wanted 25 meters by 25 meters. Now the planning permission for that usually takes months if not years to be able to, to make a, a piece like that. But, um, Glasgow City Council moved really quickly. They gave them that space. They were able to paint over um, a, a piece that had been there from the Commonwealth Games, so it was a bit dated, but they gave them the space and they worked tirelessly, like, like 24 hours a day in their small team to be able to put the faces of the indigenous peoples from the, 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 um, from the South, the Global South, um, there as a reminder and as witness to what, um, what was aiming to be achieved in Glasgow for COP26 and forevermore it will be there. And we will all go look, to, we'll all pass that by. Wow. So closing today's webinar will be John O'Reardon, founder of the Climate in the Arts series in honor of his late wife, Gail O'Reardon, a beloved music teacher and cellist with the Victoria Symphony. John, who also happens to be from Edinburgh before immigrating to Canada, plays viola with the Victoria Chamber Orchestra and is a chorister with the Victoria Philharmonic Choir. John completed his public service career as Deputy Minister for the Ministry of Sustainable Resource Management with a commitment to ensure that we live within nature's limits. In that role, he led a joint Indigenous Provincial Government Reconciliation Agreement on preserving the Great Bear Rainforest. After leaving government, he taught a graduate course in resource planning and public policy at UBC to inspire students to pursue careers to tackle the climate and biodiversity crisis. He advises the Polis, the Polis Project on Ecological Governance at the University of Victoria on watershed resiliency and on climate change adapta adaptation. Thank you so much for joining us. So Francis, it's easy to be negative about the results of COP26. It was too little commitment towards 
reduction, commission emissions reduction by 2030, and too little financial assistance was pledged by rich countries to developing the net, the net uh, developing countries. This chart indicates that the pledges for 2030 will result in a 2.4 degree global temperature rise by 2100. And even with net zero pledges by 2050, it would still result in a temperature increase of 1.8 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. So realistically, the current pledges for global emissions reductions will have to be doubled by 2030 if we are to keep the 1.5 target alive. And as you know, the current 1.1 temperature increase is creating extremely damaging weather events globally across the world. And so we need to keep that 1.5 degrees Celsius alive, even if it's by a slender thread. The costs of infrastructure repairs and adaptation will soon become overwhelming as the climate emergency deepens. And we're experiencing this in British Columbia with the recent flooding. But Climate in the Arts focuses on hope and solutions. What used to be unimaginable is now real. The intense heat dome, the wildfires, the flooding, the droughts, and the destructive hurricanes are all creating havoc. As you can see from this chart, the sudden rise in atmospheric carbon in the last century is creating this massive disruption to the Earth's atmospheric and oceanographic systems. Nature and the increasing threat to public and mental health is spurring humanity to actions in ways which we could not contemplate even five years ago and will continue to do so. So let's look at the positives from COP26. Climate change is both inevitable and unstoppable. But so is the change to human consciousness from individuals focusing on their own welfare to begin caring about living within Earth's planetary boundaries and transitioning to a just society. We will be presenting a webinar on this change in human consciousness later on this season. In my mind, COP26 provides a bridgehead to transformational change. In 2015, only one country had set a carbon for net zero carbon by mid-century, Bhutan. In 2021, 74 countries have set such a commitment and they cover 88% of carbon emissions. There's also much more accountability built into Glasgow compared to Paris. All nations now must report progress every year rather than once every five years. And there's now transparency for what's called radical transparency, whereby independent monitors can track actual carbon emissions by sector and by country and publish results in real times. Countries can run, but they can't hide. Nations made progress on finance. There's a commitment to establish $100 billion a year climate finance mechanisms by 22-23, to double adaptation finance by 2025 to at least $40 billion a year, to establish a loss and damage fund to assist developing countries recover from climate catastrophes and to establish a carbon market, which will inevitably put a price on carbon. So Francis, again, I urge you to imagine the unimaginable. Pricing carbon is the only way that we will be able to, solute, to have a financial solution. 13 years ago, British Columbia was the first jurisdiction in North America to establish a price on carbon. Now more than 40 countries and 20 states and provinces and cities, including China, have some form of carbon pricing. It's entirely possible that all emissions will be priced by the end of this, uh, this decade. The commitment for the US and China to collaborate on carbon reduction and energy transformation is potentially a breakthrough to global governance. But the biggest boost to solutions from Glasgow came from the subnational and non government sectors. There were pledges to cut carbon emissions, align the financial sector with net carbon zero targets, ditch the internal combustion engine, accelerate the phase out of coal, and end international financing for fossil fuels. Last, but by no means least, COP26 finally made the link between nature and carbon. 
and deforestation due to agriculture, manage national waterways, improve climate, uh, ocean science, and include nature-based carbon sequestration in national carbon targets. We will be exploring this new approach to nature-based solutions in a future webinar. But as Simon pointed out, observers found that the energy engagement of public interest groups of youth to be palpable. This demand for change came from the community level. It's also inevitable and in unstoppable. Solutions will come from the community level, thereby levering action from national governments. We are witnessing this creative energy at the, at the individual and community level on today's webinar. And we will continue to give community-based solutions a full profile over our next three webinars. Lots of hope, Francis. Let's keep okay. going. Thank you, John. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, we're nearing the end of the program, and we do have a number of questions. Obviously, we won't get to them all live, but what we will make sure is that whatever questions we don't get to, we will um, include with the replay link. So I'm just going to just answer one of the first questions that came in from Mac. Um, asking if we could provide some specific case studies or a showcase of innovations, innovative initiatives related to regeneration. Are there projects, organizations? Yes. In fact, everybody should know about Drawdown. This is bcdrawdown.org, who happens to be one of our esteemed climate partners. And this is a grassroots organization based on the work of the Pachamama Alliance and also inspired by the work as our graphic um, on regeneration here is by the work of Paul Hawken, who is the author of several books relating to how we can overcome climate change in one generation and it's very solutions based. And what the drawdown people are doing with their programs is uh, getting into action series where they'll teach the public in fun ways, they engage the public and teach people how to take action into their hands. And Eleanor, I know you were part of that as well. So um, you've, you, I've heard you and that's how we met was through uh, Drawdown BC. So I hope that answers that question. Anyone else wanna add anything into the chat to add to that? They're more than welcome to, and we will include that. And we have time for one or two questions. I'm going to, um, Gwen Bridge um, joined us. So Gwen, are you live there? I don't know if you've been able to stay on. Hello. Hello, thank you so much for that awesome interview. Um, we've had a couple questions and it seems like some of them may be directed towards you. So one of the things was, um, was around creating unity. Like how do we create unity and, and how um, can we address the issues of indigenous de demands apparently for land back? This is from um, Dawn. And is there something you could just quickly add to that? Yeah, I think one of the things I think I mentioned in the talk uh, I just gave was about ethical space. And so it's an interesting concept. And if you're interested, if you Google ethical space in Reg Croshu and Voices of Understanding, a document written by the Alberta Energy Regulator, it's a succinct and eloquent description of ethical space. And I was working with these concepts, but he really um, describes it well. And what ethical space is predicated on is this deep understanding of the other. So when we, we think about unity and you think about disparate cultures, there's a gap right now in the way that we understand each other. I would argue Indigenous people have a fairly fulsome understanding of what's contained within the Western systems, including democracy, including capitalism, including the Canadian legislative framework. What's not so robustly understood, I think, by non-Indigenous people is what's contained within the systems of Indigenous knowledge, Indigenous peoples, including, um, you know, what, what, is, what are our chief, what are those protocols and values, what are alternative systems of decision making that are not not necessarily democrat democracies. What are the religious and spiritual inputs that go into decision making within those societies? So for me, it's uh, the onus is really on Indigenous people to be able to bring forward that knowledge, rightly or wrongly. Um, it's really that time and Reg's point, and I concur, 
that it's really important to bring forth that understanding so that others can understand. Only then, once you have a deeper understanding, can you begin to create something new. So ethical space is fundamentally a creative space. So I really appreciate your guys' is creatively united um, because it allows you, once you have the understanding, to really um, think about what could exist. So it's a visionary and a creative space. And that I really like because it's not uh, oh, I'm right, oh, you're right, oh, we should do it this way or my way, or, you know, we are just, this system's valid and this system's not valid. So that I think um, is, is my goal in working through that is to build that understanding so we can get creative, um, respect each other's systems and knowledge and hopefully um, build something really cool. You are so articulate. Thank you, thank you, thank, thank you. you. And, and we'll send you a couple other questions since we're really tight on time right now. But I'd like to throw another one out there to Eleanor now. Um, uh, thank you, because we've got a few of our guests still on here. And Eleanor, there is a question, another question here. How do you how do you eat uh, <laughs> how do you eat if you hate the taste and time to prepare a vegan diet? Like, could could you just uh, you know the total cost of the supply chain and chemicals, etc. That, you know, is it really a lower impact for these types of food? This is from Dawn again. Making plant-based does not have to be difficult. You don't need to take dry beans and soak them for two days. Use a can of beans. There really are easy ways. Substitute into your favorite meat recipe. Substitute a plant-based item. Um, keep it simple. There are easy ways to eat vegan. And Emily may have something else to say. Yeah, I was just going to say, just add to it that I think um, sometimes we, we complicate it in our heads. And I think there's so many fantastic dishes that we already eat that we might not realize are plant based or that with a simple tweak here or there, we can start to reduce um, the animal products that are in those. So pastas, curries, stir fries, soups, like, um, and just from personal experience, I can add in the chat later and, and more details. But grew up in Saskatchewan, every meal had, had, you know, meat and dairy in it. So, um, I really think it's just giving yourself some time and building up the, the recipes, um, in your database to really just start making the shift and every little bit matters. You don't need to make a, a massive change overnight. Baby steps can make a big difference. In the sort of the meat and dairy movement, there's a spectrum of activists from people who believe that everyone should become vegan to those who support animal agriculture. And I'm more on the latter side. I don't think there's anything wrong for environment and health with eating small, judicious amounts of animal products. Not all activists agree with me, but I would just say, don't be too hard on yourself. The people asking the questions, uh, cut it way back and have fun with some uh, plant-based substitutes. And thank you for your questions. Dawn, we man managed to answer a few of them. We're going to send these questions off to our panelists where they're appropriate and we'll get answers that we'll post with the video replay link. So do tune in please um, uh, to creativelyunited.org to stay on top of what else we're on top of. And everyone who registered will receive a notification of the link in the next newsletter. And watch your inbox for that and enter to win a $100 gift card from Lifestyle Markets by just simply visiting creativelyunited.org and entering this contest. We have a few of these to give away, so here's your chance. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you to our esteemed guests. We're so grateful, and we'll be in thank touch. Thank you, Francis. Thank you, Francis. Thank you. Bye for now, everyone.